Hi there, welcome back to IndyCar on the 13th of July. Now, I thought it might be worth clarifying one or two things. Um, considering the way the political machinations are going at the moment with uh, what looks like an impending Westminster election next year and the way the various parties are manoeuvring basically for position when it comes to this next general election. It's been announced today by Stephen Flynn of the SNP that the SNP will not do any pact with the Labour Party uh, at Westminster. Now, this is an interesting but I think largely uh, superficial comment because Sir Keir Starmer has already said, in fact many Labour uh, front benchers and many Labour spokespersons have already said that the Labour Party doesn't intend to do any deals with the SNP either in Westminster. Now this signals, I think, uh, positioning of the chess pieces for a general election, but it doesn't seem, at first glance at least, to have any relationship at all with any plans to use a general election as a plebiscite. This is more to do uh, with making sure that the battle lines are drawn for a normal general election. Now, remember that all politicians of every party in a general election are aiming to secure seats. They are looking to have a job for five years. And no matter which way you slice this, that is the primary motivation of most pol pro professional politicians, is to be in politics as an MP at Westminster. And you can't really deny that. That's what it's all about. <coughs> now, on the other hand, if you look at it from the side of the uh, English Parliament and the English state, and I'm using the term English on purpose, incidentally, the the English government, if you want to call it that, the, the English um, Parliament itself, sees a general election as just that, a general election. They will not accept any plebiscite inserted into that as some kind of indication of a Scottish uh, need for independence. And they certainly will not respect a, any kind of win, either in seat numbers or in vote count, or both, in fact, uh, by the SNP or SNP and ALBA together at Westminster as some kind of trigger point for them to start negotiating independence. When you actually look at the, um, the political strategies of both ALBA and the SNP, they share one common element and that one common element is that success in either party's strategy at a general election leads them to a point where they say that they will engage in negotiations with the English government on the subject of independence. Now the problem with this is that neither party has any idea how that negotiation can come about because they appear to accept and this is just by inference, really, um, that Westminster is still sovereign at this point, and therefore they don't have any uh, additional leverage to exert on Westminster or on the English state to actually come and negotiate anything at all. And, of course, we know from experience that the English state will just simply refuse to negotiate. They will refuse to recognise any... SNP or SNP ALBA combined win at a general election, either with seat count or with vote count or both, as any kind of demonstration of the will of the Scottish people for independence. Um, I think the very, <laughs> even if you were the most optimistic person in the world and the English state was going to behave itself, the best you could expect from any negotiation would be maybe they might give permission for another independence referendum, but either way, it doesn't matter which of the two parties' uh, strategies you look at, you end up at this point where they have to ask the English state to negotiate independence. And we know that that will not happen. And the reason it will not happen is because the English state has lost its empire, it has lost all other sources of income from the natural resources of various conquered nations. They've lost them all, except for Scotland. And you have to remember that Scotland, out of the three Celtic nations, is the only nation which has the massive natural resources which England needs to finance its extravagant spending uh, on itself, basically, but not on the welfare state and certainly not on the English NHS. So we have 
a series of expectations in a general election where uh, both the SNP and the Labour Party are claiming they will not do deals with one another, presumably in the event of a hung parliament where forming a coalition government between Labour and the SNP might be the only way to get rid of the Tories. <coughs> However, this goes back to conventional politics, and conventional politics is about winning seats. It's about MPs' bums on the green benches at Westminster. It is nothing at all, in fact, to do with independence, and the English state will see it that way. Now, because of this, uh, and a number of other factors, there isn't actually anything at the end of the rainbow with either of the policies of either ALBA with their combined Scotland United policy, which, I mean, it's laudable to have everybody behind the same uh, the same goal uh, and all voting for different parties are supporting independence and some kind of agreement between those parties beforehand. Again, very unrealistic because we know the SNP will never do a deal with ALBA for the same reasons that ALBA and the SNP will not do deals with Labour. So all of the political um, furniture manoeuvring is basically just setting up the same old, the same old, another Westminster election where independence is not on the agenda. And so we can't really get independence this way and we haven't actually seen any coherent plan yet from Hamza Yusuf, although that may change. But at the moment, there's absolutely no sign of a coherent plan which has any realistic possibility of success. Same goes for Alba. Unfortunately, Alex Hammond, although he is far more combative and perhaps a more able politician, and Alba's ideas for uniting everybody behind the common purpose were all great, they all end up at the same point. They back off when it comes to the critical uh, moment when you actually have to take back control of all of the powers to Holyrood. And this is the step that none of our current crop of politicians are prepared to take. To them, this is crossing a red line. And I remember somebody quoting recently Michael Russell, who in exasperation when people were pointing out to him the futility of the SNP's position, he said, you have no idea who we are up against or who we are dealing with. I think we do have a very good idea who we're up against and who we're dealing with, and we know that the English state is not going to negotiate independence based on any election result. I don't think it's realistic. So the only option, and it is the only option in terms of a lawful, recognised process for gaining independence, is a referendum, a specified binary choice between keeping the union and ending it, in which all of the electorate of Scotland participate and they get to choose the future of their own country. This is known as self-determination and this is a basic human right accepted the world over and it is fundamental to the Charter of the United Nations. It's guaranteed to all peoples across the planet. So the only way we can get independence legitimately, given the fact that our politicians will not step over that last hurdle and actually take back control and hold an actual referendum in defiance of Westminster because they will not or cannot do that or are too scared to do that or are being threatened if they do. The only step that you can take is basically to um, use the popular sovereignty that we already have. As I've mentioned so many times in this program, I'm sick of saying it, the Scottish people have sovereignty. We are the crown of Scotland, we are the community of the realm, and we have this unique power to actually make our governments, make our politicians do what they should be doing, which is holding a lawful referendum under Scotland's own constitutional settlement and under the precondition of the Union Treaty itself, which is that we have the right to vote on our future. We have the right to remove any governments we don't like. We have the right to choose the form of government which we think best suits our needs in the future. The way we do that is by exercising that popular sovereignty. And there will be a means for doing that. Now, the other thing is that exercising your right to popular sovereignty sovereignty means everyone who is of voting age, who is registered to vote, needs to get behind it, needs to adopt the principles embodied in self-determination at the same time, and that requires some organisation, and again, 
that will be present later this summer. In addition to that, it's worth remembering that if the United Kingdom government refuses any possibility of a referendum under their own system, that's the United Kingdom's system, which we expect anyway, and if our Scottish politicians are reluctant or unable to take that step and actually hold a referendum by passing legislation at Holyrood in defiance of the 13-year-old, incidentally, Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, which actually has no jurisdiction in Scotland and tried to ban us from holding a referendum illegally against our constitutional settlement. If they continue with that, and if our politicians, and I'm talking about ALBA, the Greens and the SNP, if they refuse to take that final step and introduce and pass that legislation, then we have to take it to a higher authority. And that would mean exercising our right to popular sovereignty and going over their heads to the United Nations and taking it uh, to the European Court of Human Rights, first of all, because it is a breach of our human rights to deny us the democratic right to determine our own future. We then have to go to the UN and its decolonization process as well, because we are effectively trapped in a colony. We're not being permitted to vote to leave it. This takes time. But on the other hand, the United Nations is capable, it is able, and it has a structure and a procedure for holding a referendum in a country where the, um, the overbearing larger countries' laws don't permit it. The UN can step in and organise a referendum under its own auspices. It can supervise it. It can make recommendations. It can veto anything which is illegal in that process. It can set that referendum up, hold it, and recognise it. And all the other nations in the United Nations would also have to recognise the result under the Charter. This is the ultimate and final option that the Scots people have. And it may well be that because our own politicians are too scared to step over that line, they're fearful about what may happen to them, their loved ones, they might be uh, subject to blackmail or smear attempts by a very nasty uh, United Kingdom um, civil service or other actors working within the Scottish establishment. If they're worried about that and they can't take that step, then the United Nations is the only other option. And that requires a coordinating organisation to make that happen. And that will also be present, I think, later on this summer. So what I'm telling you here is that I don't think, based on the evidence that's available at the moment from the various parties, that any of their plans can possibly lead to actual negotiations with England on the future of the Union. For several reasons. One is that the SNP's popularity at the polls has taken a major hit. It is now polling uh, at about a third of the available electorate. The combined might of the Unionist parties in Scotland is likely to win more seats. The Tory voters will switch to voting for Labour MP candidates. And so we will end up either not getting the majority of seats, having a potentially hung Scottish Parliament as well as a hung English Parliament with no chance of any pacts or deals, no ability to negotiate with other parties to get an independence referendum, and a stalemate. And heading for a stalemate like this might suit politicians because it keeps them in work and it perpetuates the system that gives them their employment, or we end up with nothing. I, I can't see any way in which any of these plans arrive at independence or even a referendum for that matter. They simply don't have the muscle and they don't have, uh, or they haven't got a method for forcing England to negotiate the end of the Union if we did vote for it. It requires a referendum. You can't escape the ultimate question is, should we stay in the Union or should we not? And a, a referendum is the only way you can decide it. And if you're banned from having a referendum by the country next door, you need to stick two fingers up and say, we're going to have a referendum anyway. Your so-called Supreme Court, which is only 13 years old and has no, absolutely no legal uh, credibility and no legal powers over the Scottish border, we can defy you and we will defy you and we will legislate for this and all your 
complaining and attempted vetoes will not make any difference to that. But that requires courage and it requires people who are prepared to risk it all, to throw their hat in the ring and say, this parliament is now fully empowered. The people have asked us, demanded of us, that we take charge of this process and hold a referendum so that they can exert and use their right to self-determination under international law. And frankly, it's not going to end well. I don't see the next year's general election as any kind of stepping stone to independence. It will simply be stonewalled by the UK. The United Kingdom's government will just simply say, no, this is just the general election. You have no right to self-determination. We're not giving you permission. End of story. And then what does Alba, the Greens and the SNP do about it? What can they do? They're too frightened to step over that red line for fear of what the English state might do to them or to Scotland. But this is again the problem. And this is why self-determination and decolonisation are potentially the only ultimate way of getting out of this situation. Anyway... I'm sorry I've ranted on for a bit of a long time today, but I think it's important to remember that unless and until the three independence parties of Scotland become more popular, have a coherent plan, are brave enough to legislate, to hold a referendum in defiance of the Supreme Court, then nothing will move. It can't move because we are too timid, we're too scared, and we're too cowed by our big brother next door neighbour who is bullying us into submission and forcing us against our will to stay in the Union and not allowing us the democracy we need to leave it. The denial of democracy is the definition, under international law, of a colony. And if we are not permitted the democratic process to vote on the future of the Union, then it is not a Union. It is a colony. We are forced into submission basically by rule of force from a next door neighbours ten times our size. Does this sound familiar to you? Because this is what the Russians are attempting to do by force of arms to Ukraine. The British state, or the English state, is attempting to do it to Scotland by subtle threats, intimidation, uh, using all sorts of legal loopholes and inventing laws and inventing new legislation that prevents us from doing anything. It is, the effect is the same. It's intimidation, it's cowing people, it's making them fear taking that last step. And that's essentially how colonizers work. They keep you in fear, they keep you confused, they keep you divided. We do need to unite, but we need a plan which leads to a referendum and it needs to be backed by all three parties. And if they don't do that, then the people themselves will have to remove those parties and start over with the United Nations themselves. You know what they say, if you want something done well, do it yourself. And that really is my message today. I think we are going to have to DIY our own referendum here because I, I just do not see the politicians having the courage to do it themselves. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.